Are we live? Yes, we are live. Okay, everybody. Yay. Hey, guys. Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com. It's been a super long time since I did one of these videos. Uh, we're going to have something special today. I'm not alone. I'm with my good friend, Holly Kotze. Is that how you say it, Holly? It's actually Kotsia, but Kotsia. you can say Kotsia or as well. It's okay. in South African surname. So yeah, yeah <laughs> Holly's coming to us all the way via Skype from Majorca. And um, I'll give you a little background on this. Holly and I met because we were both uh, admins in the Panic Disorder group on Facebook. And um, Holly's awesome. I'm telling you guys this right now. <laughs> Listen to every word she says uh, because she is like a textbook living walking example of how you do this. If you follow me at all and you hear all the things that I talk about, Holly is actually a textbook example of how you do this. So Holly, tell us a little bit about how, I, I, we know how we're friends now, but tell us a little bit about, I guess, your story. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'm okay. So I first suffered from panic attacks, panic disorder when I was 11. I'm 33 now and I was 11 and I had really bad panic attacks, like, like top scale stuff. You know, um, I was off school for like nine months. It felt like a continuous panic attack that I was in and I just had the most horrendous time. And I thought, I just didn't know what was going on or anything, you know? And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how much detail to go into, but I basically got myself a little bit better and I've always like suffered on and off a little bit. And then I don't I don't really know how to, to sort of like say, but like through my 20s, I still sort of like lived quite adventurously. I decided to not let anxiety sort of get in my way, even though I suffered it very badly still. And um, so I was kind of like quite a high functioning sort of panic disorder sort of person and because I was like missing one key piece of information which I sort of think I now have um, and yeah and it's like and now I'm 33 and in the last couple of years for sure I feel like I've like found that missing piece and that's not to say I, d I still suffer panic attacks occasionally I still not panic attacks but like anxiety um, and I'm currently five months pregnant and at the beginning of this pregnancy which is my first one and it's very exciting but Yay. at the beginning of this I was I had a really hard time for about two weeks it seemed like such a long time but it, actually looking back on it it was about two weeks of, of really bad like where I kind of forgot how to deal with with it again um but I'm happy to say that I'm back on track and yeah. everything's good <laughs> I think you, you you and I spoke when you first found out you were pregnant and I remember yeah. you struggled a little bit but in the end you, again you were a textbook example of like you had been through this you learned a lot of the techniques and you understand the concepts and it all seemed to come back to you right away so exactly. I think what I'm going to throw out there and we'll, this will be a recurring theme as Holly and I work together on these podcasts I think is I, I think and correct me if I'm wrong but I think the key for you has been learning to not try to escape it or avoid it but to just sort of let it be there and I will tell everybody listening that Holly is actually a very talented working professional musician so if you really want to freak out while listening to us talk imagine that Holly actually makes her money on a stage in front of people performing <laughs> original music so it's like the worst possible case so you know I, I think take uh, a little bit of I think inspiration from this awesome human being that we have here with us <laughs> I guess she will help us lead the way so t we are going to start a series today um, you may have heard me talk about Dr. Claire Weeks before she wrote some amazing books you can find them on Amazon they're all really cheap uh, Claire Weeks C-L-A-I-R-E -E, Weeks is W-E-E-K-E-S she was an Australian psychologist right um, she's been gone since I think around 1990 or so Holly jump in if I'm wrong here but uh for me, Claire Weeks set the gold standard by which I judge every other approach to anxiety disorders and panic disorder. Uh, she speaks in, or spoke in very simple terms. She did her very best to describe these things as uh, disorders of thought and thinking. Uh, and she really, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of cognitive uh, cognitive therapy overtones in which she wrote and she's all about understanding what goes on when you're experiencing anxiety and panic and really the way to best approach it which is to do completely the opposite of what you think you're supposed to do to invite it in to not avoid it to just let it be there to learn how to relax and float through it and just keep doing that and learning to do that with courage and perseverance so I'm a huge Claire Weeks fan Holly I know you yeah. are too no um, me too yeah yeah so and in fact what, what, during when I was really anxious during this pregnancy at the beginning as well it was I reread what gave me the idea to do this podcast is because I reread um the piece hope and help for your nerves I've yes. got a very old copy here and um 
and it just like it just all clicked back in. I was just like, oh yeah, I know what I need to do. Like this, it was just so nice to reread it, and it was just so helpful. I was just like, we've got to get this out there, and you know, so more people know about this and can look, you know, be helped from it. Yeah, I agree 100%. This is a, she's written a few books, uh, Peace from Nervous Suffering. There's a bunch of them. We'll go through them at some point, I guess. But this one, Hope and Help for Your Nerves, this is the one I was telling Holly the other day. After I suffered my very first panic attack, which is way back in like 1986, before a lot of you listening were probably even freaking born, <laughs> um, I did go see a psychologist twice. And in the second visit, he gave me that book. I read the book in about four or five hours, maybe six hours. I'm a fast reader. And it's a short book. Uh, and honestly, had almost no problems with panic. I still had panic and anxiety, but it, it dissipated quickly once I, I read the book, understood what she was saying, and actually started to use the technique. So I know that not everybody will have that experience, but I, I think if you've been struggling and you're not sure how to do this stuff and you're not sure how to put into play the things that I talk about a lot, the Claire Weeks books are a great, great place to start. So we're going to go through Hope and Help for Your Nerves, Holly and I, together, chapter by chapter. So every episode of this little partnership will be another chapter of the book. And today we're going to start with chapter one. So Holly, why don't you talk a little bit about who Claire Weeks was and, and kind of what she did. We can go from our notes a little bit, I guess. Yeah, well, she was so she was a GP for a start. So she was a doctor that like dealt with patients. On a, she, she was actually actually she was a research biologist first, I think, and That's she's true. quite highly acclaimed in that field as well. She's a very intelligent lady, and um, yeah, she was a GP, and she started noticing because she had patients that had like you know anxiety disorders, but they weren't. I think back then, because I mean she was born in 1903, and I think back then. Anxiety disorders weren't very understood, you know. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that many people understand them now, but, <laughs> you know, broadly. Yeah. But um, she, so she sort of like developed her own program to, for, of treatment for people because one of the main things that she noticed was that rather than, I think it was that she, yeah, she noticed that her patients did not suffer from these problems because they had flawed personalities or traumatic childhoods. Rather, the problems were caused by the patient having a habit of fear avoidance, made worse or caused by a very responsive or sensitized nervous system. And that's like the whole point, isn't it? It was like she realized that it was the habit of giving fear to your symptoms of anxiety that actually perpetuated it. And so that's her whole treatment an approach was to to stop avoiding anxiety, basically. Right? I'm right, yes. yeah? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And and that was really kind of groundbreaking, I think, when she did it. And a lot of this yeah. work that she did was in the, 40, uh, in the 50s and 60s when, you know, it, they were still – she talks about the term nervous illness and people would, you know, oh, she suffers from nerves or – yeah. Right, nerves. It was nerves. And it, it, there was not a lot of uh, good information out there about this particular issue when she started doing her work. And, yes, as opposed to doing – things like trying to tranquilize people she really looked at it as a cognitive disorder uh and she talks a lot about something called second fear which is where you're reacting to the first fear the panic and anxiety fear with the second fear and it starts to snowball and you begin to live your life worried about your next panic attack and you just become like an exposed nerve where you're constantly on guard for the next one she talks about all of these things so we're going to start going through the book chapter by chapter so what I would urge everybody to do is grab a copy of the book. It's cheap online and then follow along with us. So we're going to talk about chapter one today. Um, and then I would urge you go ahead and read chapter one reference what we're talking about. And then I think we're going to be all about comments. So comment on the video or at the end, I'll give you like my Twitter and all that stuff. So you can reach out and we'll try and answer questions as we go too. Uh, maybe if we get really technically savvy, I am in the technology business. Maybe we could like live stream and take calls and stuff too, but oh my God, Ooh. I know, right? Crazy. <laughs> out of control you're where you're sitting is so awesome looking by the way it looks very pretty it's nice isn't yeah, it? yeah i'm sitting in my crappy new york office. is pretty nice yeah yeah <laughs> i'm in my like lousy office on a sunday afternoon in long island new york but anyway all right so let's <laughs> let's get into chapter one of the book uh and chapter one i think is entitled uh the power within you power within you yeah and these are short chapters the book is really a pretty easy read and you'd probably eat it up if you're having anxiety and panic problems you will eat this book right up it's a quick read yeah. and you're gonna like it so um a couple of things i think we wanted to talk about is how she she makes a pretty big claim here uh, in the book, in chapter one, she says, the advice given here will definitely cure you if you follow it, and this will take perseverance and some courage. And 
that's a pretty big claim, wouldn't you say? Yeah. 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 Especially if you read in that when you're right in the middle of like absolute despair, it just seems insane that anyone could have the goal to say that like you will be cured. It's just yes. like as if, man, no yeah, way. Yeah. You've I, got no idea how profoundly I suffer, you know. And I think that's so important because so many of us get in, especially if you're in the thick of things and you feel like I've tried this, I've tried this, I've tried this, nothing yeah. works. Um it's really, I think, natural to say, well, this person isn't going to help me. There's no way this is going to help me. But uh, in the end, I mean, I think it, it does help you. And I think it's important to say, and we'll, we'll follow up on the next thing, too. Uh, she talks about perseverance and courage is part of it. So she does never sugarcoats it. You're going to have to be brave. Yeah. Right? That's just part of it. <laughs> I, I know. It's, it's the part that everybody hates. It's the sucky part. But it is But you get to is. feel so good about yourself as well. Because like, you're just like, I'm so brave, man. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a nice feeling afterwards. You know, it's difficult to get there. But once you, once you do it, you feel so much more of an achievement as well as opposed to just oh, I went and saw this person and they hypnotized me and now I'm all better. It's kind of like I took quite a lot of personal gain from realizing that I had the power within me, you know, and that it was me that got me better. I, I found that quite nice. I, did, I was really scared for some reason when I was really ill that, like, they were going to tell me, like, it was some physio physiological, like, sort of condition and that if I took this tablet, I would then be balanced back and be fine. And I didn't really... One, it sounded weird, but like I didn't want someone to be able to come along and like fix it. I, I quite liked the fact that it was me and I was in control of this, and it just made me feel actually that like yeah, I'm in, I am in control of this, and yeah, I found that comforting. I think maybe lots of people wouldn't. I don't know why I found that comforting, but you know. No, I, I think a lot of people would find it comforting because in the end, I think her approach to this is very empowering because the first few yeah. times you have to do this, the first few times you have to do the exact opposite and just chill out into like the worst panic you can imagine, you're like, it's, there's, in no way do you want to do that. I mean, in any way do you want to do that, but you will hate doing it, but you will love having done it. So yeah. I, like I say that about a lot of hard things in life. I hate going to the gym, but I love having gone to the gym. So exactly right, yeah. s same situation like this. So it is a very empowering thing when you learn how to do this, but it is going to involve being courageous, at least in the beginning. The good news is you don't have to, you don't have to be courageous forever. I always try and throw that out there. You don't have to be like superhero or brave for the rest of your life, just in the beginning when you're starting to learn these techniques. So that's really important. Um, Oh, there's a quite a good quote that she has here in the book. She says, I have no illusions about you. Yeah. I'm not writing this book for the rare few brave people, but for you, a sick, suffering, ordinary human being with no more courage than the rest of us. And yes. I think that's quite important. That is true, because she honestly believes, I believe it, and I think, Holly, you seem to believe it too, that everybody can actually do this. This isn't, yeah. this isn't magic, and it doesn't require like an insanely brave person. Everybody has the tools built into this. So she makes another really good point uh, in chapter one, and she talks about time and how long you may have suffered from this. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, there's a nice quote. I'll just give you a little quote from her. She says, however deeply involved you may be in nervous illness, however long you may have suffered, you can recover and enjoy life again. Like, the, it doesn't the time factor isn't important here it doesn't it doesn't change you phys like physically it doesn't matter if you've suffered like for a day or for 10 years or for 50 years you know like it actually physically doesn't make a difference to your body you know like and and she says you know your body is waiting to recover like it's it's there just waiting for you you just have to yeah but um and so, like, that, that's, I think that that's really important because lots of people would say, like, oh, but I've suffered it for so long that, it, you know, I can't get better now. But it's important that with this sort of approach, it doesn't actually matter how long you've suffered it or how profoundly you've suffered it. it and that's, that's nice to know. That is true. One of the things you have to kind of embrace a little bit before you get on this journey of this type of methodology is that you really know worse than anyone else. Everybody claims to have the worst possible case of treatment-resistant panic disorder ever. Yeah. Um, it's probably not the case. And I think th to talk about the time thing, uh, panic disorder, if you look at it, or any anxiety disorder from a cognitive standpoint if you look at it as a learning situation and a behavioral thing it doesn't get worse 
Like it's not a, it's not something that gets worse, like you know, heaven forbid, cancer or something like that, which will spread and get worse and, mm. and make you sicker. This does not get any worse. At some point, there's a point where it cannot get any worse. If you have gotten to the point where you've stuck yourself in your house and can't leave because of this, that's as bad as it gets. It can't get any worse, no matter how long you do that. So, it's almost nice when you hit that point because you just right. like literally can't get any worse than this. That's it's absolutely true. <laughs> so whether or not you you've only been dealing with it for six months or for sixteen years, it doesn't matter matter, you can still get better at this. And part of it is the way you look at it. And so she talks about this as being an illness of how you think. So one of my favorite quotes, like you said, however long you've been on your body is waiting to recover. She says, it's important to understand this because your illness is very much an illness of how you think, how you think affects the way you feel. Uh, and really, this is kind of the basis of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. So Holly, you pointed out that she's not saying it's all in your mind. And, and I know we all hate when people say that it's not yes. all in your head. But at the same time, <laughs> it, 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 it kind of is because really what fuels panic, the difference between a panic attack, and I've done past episodes on this, a panic attack is a physical thing, but panic disorder is a cognitive thing. So it really is an, a disorder of how we think and how we yeah. react. It's not a disorder that's physical or even some sort of chronic mental illness that needs to be corrected. There's no structural defect in your body or your brain that's causing this. It's purely a learned response. So panic disorder is a learned response. It's just that, you know, that habitual phobic avoidance of, of what you think is going to hurt you when really it won't. Yeah, there's a really interesting bit in the, when I was like reading a bit about Chloe Weeks herself, it said that she um, suffered herself from panic attacks and panic disorder. And like, um, there's some guy who's written, Dr. Robert DuPont describes in his book, The Anxiety Cure, that he, he met her and he asked her if she'd ever had panic disorder. And she said, yes, I have had what you call panic attacks. In fact, I still have them. Sometimes they wake me at night. And Dr. DuPont responded by saying he was sorry to hear that. And um, then he said that Claire Weeks looked at him sort of in shock and responded like, well, save your sympathy for somebody else. I don't need it or want it. What you call a panic attack is merely a few normal chemicals that are temporarily out of place in my brain. It is of no significance whatsoever to me, which is like literally the whole point. And it might sound like complicated if you at the beginning of this at the minute, but it's that I still have, I can still have a panic attack now but it doesn't actually like and as awful as it sounds that like because people might say oh you never really c can be panic free but you still might have panic attacks you just learn to live with them that doesn't sound like very appealing you know like when you're really like suffering from them but what you start to realize is that a lot of what's so horrible about a panic attack is just the way you respond to it. It's not actually, like, if you actually think about what's happening, it's just like, oh, I'm sweating and uh, I'm breathing fast and my heart's beating fast and I feel a bit dizzy. Like, it's, you kind of think, like, when you break those symptoms down, it's not actually that horrific. And so if you have a panic attack and you're not responding to it in like, a, oh, my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me way, then, like, those symptoms are just, it is just a you know, a couple of physical symptoms that is, are sort of at the wrong time and place, you know, and and that's that's the sort of point of it. I don't know, I've just come off track a little bit. No, 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 that's totally on track because it really is the basis of how she approaches this as, you know, she calls it an illness of how you think. I, I would call it cognitive break or a cognitive uh not dysfunction i forget I've, I've used the term a bunch of times i can't remember my own terms at this point but um <laughs> yeah it's really exciting isn't it so uh I, I think you're right because in the end she's going to talk about j exactly what you said that these are just physical sensations and it's not the sensations uh sh your heart may beat really rapidly it may even skip some beats here and there and she talks about that in the book like that's it's okay it's still a perfectly good heart your hands yeah. may, hands may shake but she literally says your hands may be shaking but they're still perfectly good hands so there you're it's your body just doing exactly what your body is supposed to do in the you know in the presence of all that adrenaline we just interpret it as a dangerous thing it's funny when you're down the gym and you're running or if you go for a run or a bike ride or swimming your heart's beating faster but you don't go like oh my god my heart's beating faster this yeah. is what's wrong with me but when you when it sort of beats faster out of context it seems really in a panic attack it seems really really scary but like so it's just about taking that fear because your heart beating fast isn't dangerous it beats fast all the time if you're doing physical stuff That's you exactly know right. like there's nothing dangerous about a beating heart that a heart that's beating fast yeah. so it's just 
putting it in context and real and like changing the way you react to it basically that's true it is all about the reaction so i think the takeaway really in chapter one of the book and again it's a it's a really short chapter which is great because it's it's easy to read um you know where she talks about that it's an illness of how you think that everybody can be cured by it which i know is a, a cured from it or overcome it which is really big a big bold claim but um <laughs> You know, there's a lot of stuff in here. It doesn't matter how long you've suffered. Uh, and once you start to adopt this approach, you can actually start to turn the corner. So that's really the basis of chapter one of the book is that the, the answer really lies within you understanding what this is and how you are going to approach it and start to change how you react to it. So this is not Claire Weeks saving you. It's not Holly saving you. It's not me saving you. It's not a coloring book saving you or a call to your mom or your boyfriend saving you. It's you saving you. Yeah. Right? So we talk about a lot, like you have to learn to be your own safe person. And that's what this book is all about. It, it starts to explain how that can happen. So that's chapter one. It's a short one. Next time we'll do chapter two. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to this, Holly? No, I don't think so. I think we've covered, I think we covered everything that we wanted to I or what so. was in the chapter one. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. I think so, too. So chapter two is the episode we'll do next. And we're not even quite sure how often we're going to do these things. Um, <laughs> I th we're hoping like maybe every other week when we can squeeze it into our schedule. But uh, chapter two, a little preview is called How Our Nervous System Works. And she does talk a little bit about uh, without getting into a lot of real technical details. She does talk about how your nervous system works and creates these sensations that we experience when we're experiencing anxiety or panic. And it's a really good overview because she really works hard to demystify what's going on. She's yeah, all about- knowledge is power Exactly, here, like, yeah. yeah. She was huge in that, not being bewildered. She uses the term bewildered and confused yeah. all the time. And she really tries to take that away. So next time we're gonna talk about that. So anything you wanted to say to wrap it up? I don't think so, I don't think no. So. Okay, <laughs> so I would say this. This, this is going to get published all over the place. So it'll be on my website, thatanxietyguy.com, thatanxiety and I guess on my YouTube channel. It's on. I have a YouTube channel. So it'll be there. You can comment on the blog page itself, on the blog site itself. You can comment on YouTube. Twitter is at that anxiety guy, and Facebook is that, that anxiety guy also. So, Holly, do you have, would you like people to reach out to you? Do you just want to go through this way, or we'll work that out as we go along? Comments yeah, are always we'll welcome. Yeah, we'll work it out. But comments, definitely. And, yeah. like, especially if uh, – I just wanted to say that, like, I think that us do it – the reason we I wanted to podcast this is because when I was really – like ill at the beginning I and I was young as well but like my dad said to me who had a bit of experience with this stuff he, he gave me the book and was just like you need to read this like this is important like you'll see that you're not alone and all this sort of stuff and this was before the internet and um, I was so scared to read I didn't want to open the book because it's quite it's, it, feel, it felt so intimidating to like sit on my own and read a book and I didn't know what was inside it. I didn't know what it was going to tell me and I just was really scared about reading it. And so I know that that might sound strange, but when you're like really in the thick of it, it can seem very intimidating to read a self-help book or, you know, and you don't know if it really is going to sort of what it's going to tell you and stuff. Yeah. So like, that's why I thought it'd be nice because it's like, we're all having a conversation about the book. You're not on your own having to read it, you know, like it's just a nicer way to get it out there. But I really recommend getting the book as well. And yeah. Hold and it up again. I don't have, a, I have it on Kindle. Hold it up so people can see it. That that's the book you'll find on Amazon. It's crazy cheap. It's in the U S it's like six or $7. They even, there are even people selling used copies of it. I don't know if you have this in America, but in Britain, I use this, a website called Abe, books abe abebooks.co.uk and every every book is like 90p wow. <laughs> and it's like a pound postage or something like that and yeah. i got that off i got that off abe books like it's all second hand books but they're just so cheap it's it ridiculous. doesn't matter the books are all kind of old they've been you know out for a long time and uh, i've actually been in contact with her estate dr week's estate it's her nieces i believe in australia that's still are the administrators of the estate cool. they they are just really helpful people they love having the stuff out there I mean, it's crazy cheap for really, really good, solid advice as opposed to yeah. some of the other stuff I've seen where some programs are very expensive and really kind of based on what she's talking about anyway. So yeah. um, it's worth it. Check out the book if you don't have it. And find there's audio books. She has recordings. Just It's all really cheap, and I would urge you to try it all. So all right, I guess we're going to wrap it up. Yes? Yes, cool. So, so much fun. We're going to do it again next time. Yeah, nice Okay. Time. All right, guys, see you next time. Cheers.